And so I want to make a, a covenant with you. I want to come back to this scripture some other time and, and do it more justice. But, but for today, I want to focus on this word new. And I was watching this. Tele- Can you hear me over in the choir? I know last week some of you couldn't hear me. Can you hear me? Praise the Lord. All right. Um, uh, le- Friday night, I was watching this television show called Mad Men. Have you heard of that show? It's a new show. It's on this odd channel. You may not get it. Uh, but it's, it's about mad men. It's not about men who've gone mad. It's about men who in the 60s worked on Madison Avenue in New York City in the advertising business. That's where all the advertising work got done in those days. And I think it's a bit more spread out now. But, but anyway, they were trying to figure out how to pitch a particular product. And one man says to the other, look, just tack the word new on it and it will sell. People are fascinated with anything new. And how true it is. Consumers for years have been obsessed with a new model car. Thousands camped out overnight to buy the new iPhone. And they do the same with the iPod and the new Harry Potter books. We could go on and on. Even humbler products like toothpaste and laundry detergent. Uh, Without undergoing any significant change, the marketers attach the word new and improve, and guess what happens? Sales go up. My favorite example of this was back in the 1980s. Remember the 80s? Who remembers the 80s? Okay. Women had big hair, right? And in their dresses they had these shoulder pads and they looked like football players. Remember that? And the men did some funny things with their hair as well. Well, back in the 80s, if you wanted to, you know, meet someone and, and be romantic, you always carried in your pocket a packet of these breath mints called, what, certs. And you remember when certs got their new active ingredient? Who remembers what that active ingredient is called? What's it called? Retsin. Retsin. Who can tell me what retsin is? What's it made of? Do you know what it is? No one knows. It doesn't matter. Retsin is added and people buy it because it's new. I love that. New is viewed as good practically everywhere except in some churches. Here, new is viewed with some skepticism. And I think some of that is healthy, with good reason, because it's a good thing to want to preserve some of the good things which happen to be old. In fact, the best thing of all is very, very old. The personal knowledge of God goes back to Abraham and Sarah some 4,000 years ago. And of course, Jesus and his gospel message came on the scene 2,000 years ago. The knowledge of God and the gospel message are ancient things worth preserving and defending, for they define the reality of this world, our moral values, who we are as people and as Christians. But we must admit that we don't all agree on how to resolve all the new old tensions that we find in the church. And we're not alone in this. A lot of churches that have been around for a long time are wrestling, how do we deal with what's new and at the same time hold on to the good and what's old? How do we convey the ancient faith, the ancient content, the ancient words, the ancient message in ways which both speak to church members who've been around for decades and also in ways that speak to the average person coming in off the street, the person who wants to be part of our community but who's looking to hear the message of Christ in a language, in a, in a musical style, in a medium that makes sense of Christ message for them as people living in the postmodern world. Now other churches have tried to resolve this conflict by dividing. Go around town and look at the church signs. You'll see that a lot of them have a traditional service at one time, right? 8 o'clock, which is a bit early for I think a lot of people, maybe 8.30, maybe 9 o'clock, no later, and a contemporary service, 10, 10 10.30, 11 o'clock. Drive around and look. This is how a lot of churches are dealing with this new old tension. They're splitting up and worshiping at different times. And some of them are forced to do that by the capacity of their own buildings. Here at First Press, we have tried to deal with this whole thing in worship in a different way. We have this kind of worship service that we're in the middle of. It's called blended worship. And this is our attempt, however faulty and feeble, of including new and old as we try to convey the timeless message of Christ. I think before I move on to Scripture, the one thing I'd like to say about this blended service is that we have a large group of people here in this this building, Sunday after Sunday, who are learning how to appreciate the other style of worship and music as we blend together. And isn't that what happens or what should happen? 
Uh, some of you, maybe you're busily filling out those blue cards. And don't feel like you have to return them today. Take them home gr- or grab a hymnal. Sit down sometime. Think about it. What are your favorites? What are your favorite hymns? What are your favorite praise songs? We'll be doing some of yours in the future. We'll be doing some that are the favorite of the others that might not be your favorites. I'd encourage us all to join that group who's learning how to appreciate and blend together new and old. And I think we're doing a decent job of it. Well, having raised the topic of old new, let's turn to this wonderful text where the focus is on the word new. Here in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21, Paul says that we have three things that are new. First of all, verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded or viewed Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We have a new outlook. We have a new way of looking at things. And it's based on who we are in Christ. Secondly, we are a new creation. Verse 17 says it best. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And it all revolves around this verse, I think, in this particular text. Verse 17, that we're new creations. It's because of the new creation and that we're a part of it and that we become new creations in Christ that we can have that new outlook, that we can look at things differently than we looked at them before. And finally, the third point here in verses 18 to 20 is we have a new ministry, a ministry, Paul says, of reconciliation. We've been given a new message of reconciliation, and and based on that, we have a new ministry of reconciliation. So we're new creations, we have a new outlook, and we have a new ministry or a new mission. And the center of it all, I think, is this new creation, this whole idea that Paul expresses so well in verse 17.